All right, so this is the first of many video tutorials about Afterglow Access. Afterglow Access is software that we've been putting together and are continuing to add features to. It allow you to view the images that you've been taking with Skynet. Not just view them, but explore them, adjust them, manipulate them, and measure things in them. Basically, this is how you're going to analyze your data. Now, in this first video, I'm just going to show you the basics. I'm going to show you how to log in, how to import images into your workspace, how to zoom in, rotate, flip your image, but most importantly, how to change the brightness and contrast settings. Astronomical images have a wealth of data, and it's impossible to display it all on the computer screen at once. Uh, you can either look at the bright object and not see the faint structure in your image, or you can look at the faint structure in your image and the bright object will be saturated. So I'm going to show you how to manipulate that and get the most information out of your image that you can. And then once you have it exactly the way you want, I'll show you how to save it as a JPEG on your computer. Okay, so let's share the screen. Okay, to log in, you go to afterglow. skynet.unc.edu. Now, if you're already logged into Afterglow, it will take you straight to the workbench. If not, you're going to have to log in. And right now, the only way to do so is through Skynet. So I can click here. Now, I'm already logged into Skynet uh, in another browser tab. So it's taking me directly into the Afterglow Access workbench. If you're not logged into Skynet, it will take you over to Skynet. You'll type in your Skynet username and password, and then it will take you back here to Afterglow Access. Now you can see I already have a few images loaded. I have an image of the moon here and an image of the tarantula nebula. The nebula is there, it's actually off the screen. I'll show you how to recenter and zoom in in just a second. But the, the initial takeaway here is when you log in, whatever you were working on before is there. It remembers what you were doing. You don't have to start from scratch every single time. So that's nice, that's a nice feature. Okay, now let's get another image in here, show you how to do that. We go over here, this is the workbench that we're looking at, next to it is data providers. I'll click on that and we can see there are a couple data providers, different ways of getting data into your workbench. I'll just select view all. Currently there are only two, in the end there will be more. On the left we have a sample directory, and these are images that are available to everybody. We'll make use of some of them in the labs. There are other ones that we've put there for other educators at other institutions doing other things. But it's just a, a directory with public images. Now off here on the right, we have Skynet. These are the images you've taken with Skynet. And in the future, uh, there'll be a box here for catalogs, you know, astronomical surveys of the sky conducted by other telescopes. A lot of these uh, data sets are public and, and we'll be able to access them through here. Also, you'll be able to upload your own images taken from outside of Skynet. But right now, this is all that we have. Let's go into Skynet here. Take a look at the directory structure. We have collaboration observations, group observations, and user observations. So you want to go into the user observations. Those are the observations that you have taken, uh, or in my case, these are the ones that I've taken. There's a folder there for each observation I've put into Skynet. Now, let's see, I'm gonna load, I've picked one out here. It's a Jupiter observation. There it is. So I click on that. And in this particular observation, I had many different exposures of Jupiter taken at different times. Uh, a lot of them were taken with Prompt 5 in Chile, some with Prompt Meckering in Australia. And what we're looking at here are the raw images. These are the images straight off the telescope. They have both the astronomical object that you're interested in, in them, but also all of the defects of the camera. You know, with astronomy, we're looking at faint things usually. And the fainter it is, the more you see the camera defects, like the manufacture pattern of the sensor, or if there is dust on the lens of the camera, these things all show up in the image with the astronomical object. Now, if you're looking at something bright like Jupiter, 
uh, they don't really show, not compared to the brightness of Jupiter, only if you're looking at something faint. But regardless, what Skynet does automatically, you don't have to worry about this, but at the beginning of every night and the end of every night, it takes what we call calibration images. These are images that are designed to bring out the camera defects. And then Skynet uses them to correct the raw images, producing reduced images. And those are down here. So if you want, you can load up the raw image or you can proceed into the reduced images directory. It has all the same images, but you can see underscore reduced and added to the name. So this is the best possible image that you're gonna get. And with something like Jupiter, it doesn't matter, but with other things it does. So I would usually go to the reduced folder. Okay. Now you can select all of them by pressing this button. Uh, we don't wanna load all of them right now. I'll turn that off. There's one I picked out, uh, number 15. So I'm gonna import that. Now this is one of our smaller format cameras. It's just 1K by 1K. That's a million pixels. They load pretty quickly. Uh, other cameras are 2K by 2K or 4K by 4K. They're a little bit slower to load because you're transferring over either four times or, or 16 times as much data. But anyway, it will load. And what we're looking at here is Jupiter and its four moons, the Galilean satellites, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And it's loaded with the default brightness and contrast settings. It's trying to balance if you want to look at something bright or if you want to look at something faint. In this case, we see the moons, but the planet has been washed out. We can't see any detail. It's there, and I'll show you how to get to it in just a second. But first, let's just figure out how to move this around a little bit. We have zoom in capability here, zooms into wherever the center is, or zoom out. There's zoom to fit, and also reset zoom, which restores the natural pixel scale of the image, basically one camera pixel for every pixel on your computer screen. You can also click and drag, move it around, recenter. If you have a scroll wheel on your mouse, you can zoom in to any part that you want, or just center it and zoom in here, or use the zoom on your touchpad. Okay. Now, brightness and contrast. As I said, this is the default setting. And that's right here. And the default setting, you can see the numbers down here. We have a background level and a saturation level. And these are in percentile, so the background level is set to 10%, Saturation level is 99%. That means 10% of the pixels, it's drawing below the um, bottom most color in this particular color palette. So 10% of the pixels are black. And the saturation level of 99% means 1%, the brightest 1% of the pixels are being displayed as white. And everything in between is a grayscale. The brightest 1% are here on Jupiter and the moons. Now, as I said, Jupiter is a bright target. And so the moons, this is fine for looking at the moons, but if you wanna look at the planet itself, it's really bright. So you may want to do something other than the default presets. If we hit bright target, it keeps the background level at 10, but changes the saturation level to 99.999. So 0.001% of the pixels are now being displayed as white, and everything else is a grayscale between the background level and this new saturation level. I can zoom in here. This is a pretty good picture of Jupiter. This was taken from Chile. It's one of our better sites, nice and crisp. So we can see features, we can see the cloud structure, the banded cloud structure of the planet, and right up here we have the great red spot. Normally in pictures of Jupiter you see the great red spot not in the upper left, but the lower right. And all that that means is this picture is flipped around from how we normally see it. Actually not flipped, but rotated. Down here you can do things like flip the image or rotate the image. And there, that's what we used to seeing. And you know, if you're happy with that, you know, fill the screen and then save it. This button right here will download just the portion that you framed onto your computer as a JPEG. 
So there it is. Now I've shown you how to use these course presets for default and bright and also faint. Go back to default, but sometimes you may want to have fine control and not just use these course presets. So we can go down to these boxes here, the background level and the saturation level, and adjust them with a little bit more control. For example, if I lower the background level, you don't really see much of a change. Basically, those 10% of pixels that were colored black, uh, now it's a much, much smaller fraction. If we increase it, eventually we'll see a little bit of a change. Basically, we'll have more and more black pixels in the background. There we go. You can see it's starting to adjust here. You can see the lower bar is moving up closer and closer to the saturation level. So now we don't have a lot of dynamic range. Most of the pixels, 93% of the pixels in this case are black, 1% are white. So all the other grayscale are just going between those uh, remaining 6%. So I'm going to set that back to the default level. Now, if you really want to manipulate your image, it's normally not the background level that you're going to be changing, but the saturation level. So if we increase this moving up towards the bright target, you can see that the glow around the planet is diminished. And that's just Earth atmospheric glow. Light from Jupiter is illuminating the atmosphere on its way in, creating that kind of sky glow. And as I increase the saturation level, that disappears. And now you can see the moons are getting hard to see. The moons are gone, but the detail of the planet is coming in. But for most planets, just the bright target course preset is sufficient. But uh, often you can bring out moons by adjusting this, like right there. Okay, let's look at another image. Let me bring up this image of the tarantula nebula here. Actually, I'll zoom to fit. This is one of our larger format cameras, 2K by 2K. So, you know, it takes a little bit longer to load it all in, but that was still pretty quick. And this is a nebula, it's a star forming region. You can see the center is kind of bright, it's saturated. There's a lot of interesting detail in the outskirts. So let's try some of our course presets. If I go to the bright target preset, we lose most of the image. We just see the brightest stars. So that's probably not what we want. There's default again. I can go to faint. In this case, we're saturating more of the interior, but seeing more detail out in the outskirts. So probably what we want is somewhere between the faint level and the default level. And this is really up to your own personal aesthetics getting as much or as little as you want, but it's a trade-off between saturating the inner regions and seeing details in the outer regions. So I adjusted the, the saturation level percentile to get that the way I wanted to. Now there are other ways that you can maybe bring out more detail without saturating so much of the inside of the image. Let me go back to default here. Let's talk about stretch mode currently in linear stretch mode, but there are other options, logarithmic, square root, hyperbolic arc sine. Basically, it takes the pixel values and then runs it through one of these functions. So if I hit logarithmic, you can see it really illuminates the outskirts, um, and maybe a bit too much. You may want to bring the background level up, darken some of it. This is a different way to view your image. Here, I can see a lot more of the fainter outskirts. You know, perhaps you want to then uh, change the saturation level as well. Maybe bring it up, saturate less of the interior. And so there you can see both the interior and the exterior by doing some kind of scaling. Go back to default, I'll show you these other ones. Here's square root scaling. Here's hyperbolic arc sine. And slight differences. Use these other scalings, you probably will want to just bring up the background level a little bit to darken uh, the bottom of the image there. Some other things you can do. Uh, often, you know, we look at white on black, but you can also do black on white, inverting the image. Sometimes that makes it easier to see 
uh, on the stars compared to the surrounding nebulosity. I'll put that back. And then you also have some different color options. This is just a standard grayscale map, but here's, for example, a rainbow colored map. Uh, or often with nebula, people use the heat map. So you know, that's just aesthetics. We call this a false color map. It does not represent true colors as the human eye would see them. It's just mapping different intensities to different colors in a variety of default palettes that you can select between. Okay, one last thing I'll show you, imaging the moon. So let's zoom to fit this image here. You can see the whole moon there. And this is a, you know, a really nice image, nice and crisp. I see lots of craters. I see the terminator, the division between uh, the illuminated portion and the portion in shadow. Though it is a little bit saturated. You see these regions here, a little bit saturated. I can try different presets here. If I do faint, even more of it's saturated, so that's not the direction I want to go. If I do bright, a lot of the moon gets pretty dim, and I'm just looking at the, the light on the inner lips of these craters. So I probably want something between bright and default. So I'll go here to the saturation level and just lower that until I'm happy. I see the moon getting brighter and brighter, but I haven't saturated on the surface yet. And right around there, I'm beginning to saturate. If I go farther, you can see it's saturating, so I'll back it up a little bit. Something like that looks pretty good to me. And again, if you want to put a color palette on it, you can. Maybe the cool color palette, because it looks cool. Okay, that's it for this video.